I'm pleased to share with you today on the topic of disruptive human capital development and trade in the post-pandemic era. And it flows very well from the previous speaker from Caribbean Export because I look at some of the things um, that he would have spoken about as well. So to borrow a phrase from Sophia Petrillo from that iconic show, The Golden Girls, picture it, the Caribbean, 2030. Caribbean countries are more than tourism destinations. They're leading hubs of technology, innovation, exporters of high value added goods and services. It sounds wonderful, even idealistic, but it is possible. And as we saw from the previous speaker, some of this work is already being done in order to make this transition possible. It won't be easy, not automatic, but it can be done. As much as the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic has been a major disruption to our economies, our societies, our daily lives, it presents an opportunity to determine how we can turn the COVID-19 moment into a catalyst for the kind of trade that redounds to the sustainable development of our region. When we think of any of the great or emerging tech hubs, Silicon Valley, Shanghai, Tel Aviv, Singapore, one of the essential ingredients is that human capital endowment. The World Bank in its Human Capital Report 2020 defines human capital as the knowledge, skills, and health that people accumulate over their lives. A human capital theory, as purported by some of the early theorists like Becker and Schultz, recognizes that investments in human capital can redound to the benefit of the individual through higher income and to firms and to the economy through higher productivity. It's often said that Caribbean countries' greatest resource are our human populations, which though small in size, are among the most educated in the world. And if our diaspora populations are taken into account, well then, this resource endowment is even larger. Trade is a lifeblood for Caribbean small open economies. And our countries are generally speaking among the world's most tourism dependent. But there's some facts and some truths that we have to bear in mind. And the World Bank 2019 publication entitled Trade Matters, New Opportunities for the Caribbean highlights some of these. The fact that the Caribbean's high integration in the global economy is true mainly imports rather than exports. Our high dependence on trade makes us vulnerable to external shocks. This, under, this ongoing deglobalization, the fact that our share of global merchandise exports have been on a decline from 3% in 1970s to a quarter of a percentage in 2012. The fact that services exports, in fact, may offer the greatest potential for us, but there's still this inability of our countries to diversify into these higher value exports. So how can we remedy this? By no means am I suggesting that we completely diversify out of tourism. What I am suggesting is that we need to put our economies on a more broad-based sectoral footing than simply tourism, financial services, oil, or whatever, by expanding not just our export base, but our export partners. And we are already seeing this happen. In Barbados, for instance, we saw there was the Kenya Barbados Business Summit recently on the sidelines of UNCTAD. So there are steps being taken. What we want to do is to ensure that the Caribbean is known not simply for sun, sea, and sand, but as hubs for cutting edge medical research, AI, gaming, fintech, you name it. The Caribbean is a melting pot of creativity. We're the inventors of soca, calypso, reggae music. Many people might not know, but the inventor of Archie, the first internet search engine, is a US-based Barbadian, Dr. Alan Emptage. So is it really that far-fetched for us to think that we could have the next Steve Jobs, our next Bill Gates? Barbadian-based fintech company Bit Inc. recently partnered with the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank to develop the world's first central bank digital currency within a currency union, and is also doing similar work in Africa as well. We have to share these stories. But in all of this, how can we do more? How can we accelerate to that vision of the Caribbean in 2030? Many years ago, our governments followed to varying degrees Sir Arthur Lewis's industrialization by invitation. But maybe it's time for innovation by invitation. 
special incentive programs and special visa programs similar to what is done in the UK to encourage entrepreneurs and investors from the diaspora and across the world to create startups and invest in startups in the Caribbean that could create high value jobs and promote high value added exports. The previous speaker as well outlined some of the obstacles that firms face. And after all, if we are going to try to woo these investors, we need to ensure we have the enabling framework, not just the human resource endowment, but the legislative framework, the infrastructure, the ease of doing business. We need to improve our data availability to ensure that policy making is evidence-based and that firms and entrepreneurs have access to up-to-date data to make investment decisions. Our educational systems must produce a human resource fit for purpose for a 21st century Caribbean, not just in terms of the subjects, but softer skills needed for success. Public speaking, applying for funding, financial literacy, protecting your intellectual property. One of my favorite quotes from Sir Richard Branson is train people well enough so they can leave, but treat them well enough so they don't have to. He was speaking in the firm context, but I'm extending this to a country context. Let's be honest, we fetishize youth in engagement, but we need to really put this in practice. We have too many young, eager, motivated young people brimming with ideas, educated at taxpayers' expense, who want to make a difference. But many are leaving the region because they feel they have no opportunity for employment commensurate with their skills, or they feel they have to be politically or socially connected in order to advance. On a personal note, one of the reasons why I created Caribbean Trade Law and Development 10 years ago was because I felt a youth voice was missing from the areas of trade and development and my inability to gain employment in trade despite my skill sets. And because of that, I've been able to build a thriving consulting business. We have to deploy the right people in the right positions in governments and create an enabling environment for our young entrepreneurs to pursue their dreams by improving access to finance, cutting the red tape, and improving access to information. With regard to our firms, they have their part to do too. Because, as Peter Drucker said, culture eats strategy for breakfast. There is still a culture where workers see their work as just a means for earning a salary instead of working towards a greater purpose. Investing in employees by providing opportunities for future training, promoting holistic employment and employee wellness, making them feel appreciated making employees feel as though their advancement is not a threat, but an, in, an opportunity for the business, will be ways in which they could be increased productivity, improve workplace cultures, and ultimately greater exports by local firms. Our late Prime Minister, Professor the right excellent Owen Seymour Arthur, was a big proponent of the idea of creating a smart city centered on the University of the West Indies Cayfield campus. Our universities can be greater exporters of technology, great exporters of technology educational services rather, by leveraging the existing MOUs and creating new MOUs with the private sector to promote sector relevant research and other top tier universities worldwide to encourage student and faculty exchanges and cross university research. And finally, the diaspora. If we are going to harness our human capital for post-pandemic trade and development, the diaspora is an important part of this e equation. They are a fountain of knowledge, skills, and networks, and many in our diaspora, even down to the second or third generations, want to engage and want to contribute to the region. A couple of years ago, I had the fortune of listening to a presentation by a brilliant Barbadian scientist who is conducting pioneering, pioneering breast cancer research. And I wondered to myself if she were able to do that pioneering research based from a university here, imagine the intellectual property that would be generated at a Caribbean based university. In closing, the Caribbean has no shortage of human creativity or innovation. It is incumbent on us to use this moment as a catalyst for better deploying this talent for moving us into high technology exporting and ultimately development. Thank you very much for your attention.